our topic of discussion for today is purposeful beauty. Purposeful beauty or beauty with a purpose. And, and this is a, a suitable topic because we are women and when you say beauty, women resonate with that, isn't it? Um, so, I will start by asking you a question. When you hear beauty, or when you hear people say a woman is beautiful, what comes to your mind? How would you describe beauty in a woman? That's why I was asking for the mic. Roving. Please put your hand up if you want to contribute to this discussion. How, how would you describe beauty or what comes to your mind when you hear beautiful woman? A woman of good character. Great, a woman of good character. Another one there? A clean, well-groomed. Clean, well-groomed, like all of us here. Another one? Physical appearance. Physical appearance, aha. Uh -huh. I see the young people at the back want to say something. Beauty of the heart and the soul. Beauty of the heart and the soul, which is not necessarily something we see. Okay. Another one? To Memaliza. <laughs> Yes. A role model. A role, mo a role model. Yes. Another one. God fearing. God fearing. So many ways of describing a beautiful woman. And that is true. I think we can stop it there for now. But I'll also need somebody else with a mic to to be helping me read the passages that we are going to be reading. We will read from a few passages as we go along. Can I have a volunteer? Hey, kuna wengi sana kule nyuma. Oh, mumepitwa. Okay, I'll be telling you, but let's all turn to the book of Esther. That's where we will be taking a walk through the book of Esther. I'm sure most of us, when we hear Esther, you remember that she was a beautiful woman. But she was a beautiful woman with a purpose. Um, and so we will, I'll, I'll be telling you which particular verses to read. But so that when you leave this place, you will go away with something that you will remember. I have broken down my um, presentation or my discussion into four S's. S's, S, you know, the letter S, just to help us remember. I will talk about the first S is style. Style, S-T-Y-L-E. The second S is significance. The third one is spiritual connection. And the fourth one is strategy. So style, significance, spiritual connection, and strategy. I used to be a teacher many years ago, so if I sound like a teacher, bear with me. And so I'll start with style, and, and these are not, these S's are not in, the or, in order of importance in our lives. They are in the order in which we can glean them from the book of Esther. So we will move systematically through the book of Esther, and we are not reading all of it, but those are the four things that I would like us to focus on. The book of Esther actually has so many lessons, but today we are looking at beauty with a purpose. Let me ask my reader to first read for me Esther chapter 1, verse 11. 
Who is reading? Oh, she's there. Esther chapter 1, verse 11. Praise God. I'm reading from the book of Esther, chapter 1, verse 11. And it says, To bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown, in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials. For she was beautiful to behold. Thank you. That's the first beautiful woman we meet in this book, Queen Vashti. And maybe we think she was a rogue queen. That she, all we remember about her is her disobedience to the king. But you know, she had a reason for disobeying the king. But the Bible says that Queen Vashti was beautiful to behold. But you know, her story ends there. You don't find that story, it begins there and it ends there. It begins with her being called out to display her beauty, and it ends with her being deposed because she had disobeyed a drunk queen, a king, rather. But our focus is on the other beautiful woman that we meet in this book, Esther herself. Please read for me Esther chapter 2, verse 7, verse 7 to 15. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I say the first S is about style. And when I use the word style here, I use it to describe outer beauty, external beauty. And a number of us have talked about a woman that's well groomed, you know. You know how you do it, women, don't you? You know how much time and money you spend on your hair. Um, some of you I know may be spending quite a bit of time in those um, salons or spas, as now we call them. And when we think about Esther in terms of physical beauty, who was she? She was a Jewish orphan girl. She was young, possibly just coming out of her teenage. And she had been brought up by her cousin, not her uncle, her cousin Mordecai, who sat at the king's gate. That king, by the, because some of us struggle with the name of this king, his name was King, king who? Artaxerxes or Xerxes or Ahasuerus, depending on the version of your Bible. But the Bible says that she had a lovely figure and she was beautiful. I want you to start imagining how Esther looked like. A lovely figure. I didn't hear anybody tell us about figures. <laughs> I think among women, we call them figure eights. And, and most of us start with figure eight until the babies start coming. And then you don't know what, how that figure turns into figure what. <laughs> I, I hear some people say it turns into a figure 11. <laughs> Whatever it turns out to be, all of us start off where Esther started, with a beautiful figure before uh, our figures are destroyed, either because of the babies or because we have eaten the wrong foods or we are eating too much sugar, things like that. But anyway, the Bible says that Esther had a lovely figure and she was beautiful. This natural beauty was further enhanced by the treatments she received. And that's why I talked about her spending time in the spa. I'm not one of those people, by the way. I'm the kind of person who goes to the salon and I'm asking the beautician, uh, how much time am I going to spend here? Because I don't have that much time. But even if you do it yourself, even if you are the one who carries your own beauty treatments in your handbag, I think it is natural for women to try and enhance their looks. And there's, I think that is something we need to encourage. Please, ladies, and I have seen very many 
people here, many beautiful women. We cannot afford just to neglect ourselves. We do need to have the looks. It may not be those figures, but we can also dress our figures, eh? whatever they are. <laughs> we can dress them appropriately. It's not just seeing that card dress in the shop and it looks nice, but you don't ask yourself, will it look good on me? Anyway, that's not our point of discussion today. But I wanted you to imagine this beautiful girl. She is already beautiful, but because she has been picked to be one of the possible future queens, there is preparation that went into it. And what does the Bible say about this preparation? It was six months of being massaged with oil of mar. If you remember the story of Jesus' birth, there was a mention of mar. It's one of those very precious and special uh, spices. It has a very special oil, which is used for detoxification. It is, it is used for restoration of, of the skin and generally of the body. So six months of that, followed by six months of perfumes and cosmetics. Would somebody look the same after that? A whole year of just being pampered. Every day you wake up, you go to the spa, you're massaged with special oils for six months. After that, you begin another beauty regimen of perfumes. I, I just wonder what the issue, why would you need so much perfuming? Because perfumes tend to wear away in the course of the day. But I think they just want to change everything uh, as they, they, they prepare this woman for possible queenship. Outer beauty is what opened the door for Esther to become a queen. The passage we have just read tells us that when the king saw her, and remember there are several women. In fact, the Bible says it was a harem. A harem means many women are there, all of them being prepared, just in case one of them becomes the queen, king, Queen Vashti's replacement. We are told that the king was attracted to her. You know, the king had no time to see Esther's heart, did he? He didn't even know where she came from. And you know, Mordecai had forbidden her from revealing her, her nationality, because it would just have jeopardized her chances. So that was wisdom. But the king didn't know these women at all. He didn't know where they came from. He didn't know what kind of families they had been brought up in. All of them had the same privilege of one full year of beauty treatments. But the Bible says that the king was attracted to Esther from the moment he saw her. Then he was attracted to all the other virgins that were paraded before him. And that's why we say that this was the gift, the style. She had her own unique style. And that was the first thing that gave her an opening into the queenship. Of course, we know that God had ordained her. But supposing she had not been attractive enough for the king to see her or to notice her, then God's plan would have been thwarted. Proverbs 18.16 says that a gift opens the way and ushers, sorry, I'm reading, um, that was Proverbs what? Yes. It ushers you into the presence of the great. And I just want us to, to think about it. What, what is it about you as an individual? 
what is it about your style, about your gifting, the thing that people see first? What is it that God has given you that will open for you doors into the presence of the great? Like the way Esther's beauty opened the door for her into the presence of the king and eventually to the throne. And when I say style, it is the thing that people notice about you first. Because it is outward most of the time. It is something about you that attracts, causes an attraction for you. That people say, so and so, she is like this. It's not just about our hair. It's not about our clothes. It's not about the jewelry we wear. And, and because I know women are spending unnecessarily huge amounts of money to try and look beautiful, which is good, but uh, that is not what God calls us to. But every one of us has a very special gift, a very special style that is unique to you. Maybe it's the way you talk. Maybe it's, it's just the way you carry yourself. And, and to the young people who are here, do you know that these days there's, you can get a job by just getting into an interview room? Not because you're being asked questions and you're answering, but just the way you carry yourself tells people that this is the person we are looking for. I know of interviews these days that are carried out around tables, around dinner tables, you're not being asked about what you know. We are just observing. How do you handle your cutlery? How do you make small talk around the table? And at the end of that, you won't have known. You won't know that you've already gone through an interview. But it's over. Your case is either open or closed. So there are those things that are natural that God has gifted you with that cause you to be attractive in certain ways. But what I want us to ask ourselves is, ourselves is, what is the special giftedness, whether natural or spiritual, that God has given you to help usher you into the arena of the great? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, what is that special thing in you? Because there is something special in each one of us regardless of where we came from, regardless of our tribe, regardless of our education, regardless of our age, our marital status, there is something special in you. And today when you go home, in case you have never thought about it, think about it and ask God, how can this natural or spiritual gifting you've given me usher me into the presence of the great. But the second S I talked about is significance. Significance. Significance is about answering the question, why am I here? Because we are here, we have all been born, I'm sure all of us have gone to school up to some certain level, but the significance question about ourselves is, what on earth am I here for? Why am I here? Am I just here because I was born? I went to school, I got a job, uh, I got a family, and so on and so forth. You know the natural course of events eh, in our lives. And God forbid that any of us should be like, if, if, if you are in my generation, and I will not tell you which generation it is. It is an older generation. There was something, a, a poem we used to say about a man called Simon Makonde, who, <laughs> who was born on a, and then an, on and on and on, and on Sunday he, he died. You know, you just come, you live, you die. Or you come, you're born, you you beget, and like if you read the book of Numbers and things and, and other books like those, so and so was born and he became the father of nine, ten children, and then he died. 
That is not what we are talking about when we talk about seeking significance in our lives. Why did God place you in, the, in this earth? And because I know almost all of us here are born again, why did God call you into his kingdom? And this is the part of the book of Esther that most of us know about. My sister, read for us chapter 4, verse 11 to 14. And yet, who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Now, reflect back on Esther's upbringing. An orphan. She lost her parents when she was still young, and that's why Mordecai had to take her on and raise her. She possibly has not lived a life of abundance. And then suddenly, suddenly because of her beauty, she finds herself a queen. And not in her Jewish homeland, but in a foreign land. But there she is. She could have chosen to just enjoy herself and forget about her uncle, who was still sitting at the king's gate. She could have chosen to forget about her people, the Jews, because of course, um, in her job as a queen, there was a lot of business for her to transact. But then, and because we have not read that passage, but I'm sure you're familiar with the decree that was issued uh, with, with, with Haman's uh, conniving, that all the Jews should be killed. And of course, Esther did not know, because although she was a Jew, she was living in the palace. But it took Mordecai to remind her, or to, after he told her what was happening and what the Jews were facing, he asked her, if she could do something about it. And that was the moment that Esther realized that she was brought into this place for a significant reason. That what she was there for was not just to enjoy the goodies in the palace, to enjoy having servants waiting on her, uh, at every turn, there was a significant reason why she was in the palace. And as much as Mordecai was giving her the freedom to do whatever she chose, he asked her one question. And that is what we call the question of what is your significance? What are you going to contribute? That's why he asked her, who knows? but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther was meant to play a key role in changing the destiny of the Jewish people. And that is why God had placed, had placed her there. And thank God that she had somebody to remind her. Sometimes we are very forgetful. You have grown up, God has blessed you, maybe with a very good job, maybe you're working for a multinational company, or God has allowed you to prosper in your business. Or who knows, maybe God has placed you in political circles. You are in positions of influence. And I'm sure if I asked all of you what you do for a living, Every one of you has something you're doing. It doesn't matter the magnitude of what it is that you're doing. Even in your own home, you, whether you're married or you're single, there is a role. There is something significant God wants you to do. Have you asked yourself 
what is that one thing, or many things, but maybe, what is the one thing that God has placed you there for? Maybe you, you just think, well, I went to school, I studied whatever I studied, that is why I'm here. That's why I'm serving in this office. That is why I am serving in the county governor's office. That's why I'm a, an administrator. Maybe you, God has allowed you to go into politics and we really want to encourage as Christian women to go into politics. But when you get there, always ask yourself, why did God bring me here? Significance. God has something he wants you to change around you in that office. You're not just there to wait for promotions one after another. How is the aroma of Christ spreading in your office space? For those of you that are in the marketplace, who knows whose destiny will be changed because you are there in their neighborhood? Whose life will be different because they interacted with you? Please don't wait for the time that your picture will appear on a poster that you're now going to be the speaker, I don't know in which meetings. No, our lives are supposed to be significant every single day. And most of us will not make it to this pulpit. In fact, sometimes I wonder how do I even get here? Because I don't feel like I was prepared for this in, in very special ways. But when the opportunities come, I take them. But I want us to remind ourselves that, no, that every one of us was called, or first of all, we were born and then called by God to cause a difference in somebody's life or in many people's lives. What is that significant thing that God has called you to? Whose life is going to be different? Or as they say sometimes, who will cry when you're dead? Because if nobody will cry, then it means you never lived up to your significance. And sometimes you don't have to go very far. I like to tell women that most of us have the privilege, maybe it's not even too much of a privilege, of necessity. There are people who help you raise your children. We call them nannies or house helps or house managers. You know, the title keeps changing. But even for that young woman who is helping you at your house, are you going to change her destiny and the destiny of her family, for example? Because some of these girls come from very poor families. And God has connected you with them so that their own destiny and the destiny of their families can be changed. Have you ever thought that that girl is in your house because she lacked fees to go on to maybe university or to high school or wherever? And I'm using this as a very basic example to tell you that you have an area of influence that you can influence somebody, or you can influence their destiny the way Esther influenced the destiny of the Jewish people. I pray that the girl, your house help, will not leave your house the way she came. Will you have invested in her? Or will she live the rest of her life doing the same kind of jobs? Of course, some of you say, oh, but most of them are so unreliable. But I want to tell you, I have had a lot of experience. Now I don't usually have a house help because I don't have somebody. I don't have anybody who needs that. But I want to tell you that those are the people who know whether you're actually born again. Because you cannot pretend. First, because of your behavior, that you come from the WM meeting and when you get to your door, nimatusi, quarreling with them. 
I was surprised one time, uh, a friend of mine who is born again, I think she was still very young in her faith, but she told me, house girls, I slap them if they don't do what I want them to do. But anyway, what we are saying today is, you may not think that looking after that girl is a significant responsibility, but you do not know what you're doing. You don't know 10 years from now where she might be if you invested in her. You might be surprised. Ladies, what kind of significant contribution are you making? Spiritual connection, that is the, th the third S. Spiritual connection. Remember our topic is beauty with a purpose or purposeful beauty. And we are talking about the things, the ingredients that would cause us to show or to allow God to fulfill his purposes through us. Spiritual connection. Our theme for Sitam this year is in his presence. It talks a lot about our spiritual connection uh, with God, dwelling in his presence. Uh, my sister, read for us verse, chapter 4, 16 and 17. Thank you. Esther called Esther called a fast. Now, most of you know that in the book of Esther there is no mention of God. But these were Jewish people. When the Jews called a fast, it was for prayer. It was not, not just a hunger strike. It was to be in the presence of God undistracted. And this was a very serious fast. It was three days of eating nothing and drinking nothing. Can you imagine? The urgency of the matter at hand required God's direction. And that's why Esther, the first thing she thought about, because she had been brought up in the Jewish customs, she thought this one, I will not go anywhere. There is nothing I can do. Even if I am the queen, there are all these laws in this land that I could even be killed, even if I'm the queen, if I go to the king before he has extended his scepter to me. But that showed, or that shows you, the connection that Esther had with God. It was a deep spiritual connection. First for me. And she said even for herself and her servants, they were going to fast. You know, it is so critical that we have a vibrant, deliberate relationship with God. It is not when I have time. Because if God's purposes are going to be achieved through us, then we really must hear God. And the way to hear God is to be connected with Him through our times of prayer. And it's not just through corporate times of prayer when we come to church. We have beautiful times of prayer like we had this morning. It is that personal walk with God that causes us to be so spiritually sensitive and so spiritually connected to God. We are not distracted. We are living in an age of serious distractions, not the least of which is social media. I know we, we are so distracted by social media, who is following you on Facebook, I don't know, who is following you on Instagram, what is being posted, 
And do you know these things actually take a lot of our time? And, and they drain the energy out of us so that we are not able to connect with the Lord. Sometimes we are not able to hear God when he's speaking to us as individuals. How can we cultivate a life where distractions are kept at a minimum, even if it's our usual um, routines? In several places in the scripture where Jesus was going to pray, he would find a place. He would wake up very early in the morning. He would go to a secluded place. And you know the disciples would not know that he had left them. So they are catching up with him and telling him, everyone is looking for you. But Jesus knew that there was no way he was going to accomplish his ministry if he did not spend time with God. And imagine, Jesus himself was God, and yet he had to find quality time to spend with his Father. What about us? How spiritually connected are we? What kind of time do we give to being in the presence of God? And distracted just by ourselves, because that is when God speaks to us. Maybe not necessarily uh, when we are in corporate worship, because God still speaks. But if you really want to prove what God's purposes for your life are, you do need to lock yourself away with the Lord. You do need to separate yourself from the many things that are calling for, you, for your attention. And I also want to speak to even young mothers here, because I know one of the greatest challenges that women have is little children, like, like for senior pastors' children here. I don't even know how you manage, Mam Rose. But I like to say that um, the mother of John and Charles Wesley, those famous evangelists of many years ago, their mother was called Susanna. And Susanna had very many children. And they were not like four years apart like mine. They are the ones we call staircases. <laughs> One after another. Rose was telling me today that hers look like twins, but they still are two years apart. But Susanna Wesley had this one thing that she always did. And I'm saying this for the benefit of the young mothers, so that you don't think that you don't have time. What Susanna would do was she had this habit. If she wanted to connect with God, she would take her apron. And you know when you have many children, you're always wearing an apron, eh? Because you're always doing things around the house. She would take her apron and throw it over her head, over her face, and over her head. And all her children knew that when mom does that, you do not disturb her. And that for her was her closet. She would lock in with God. And no wonder she gave us such effective um, sons who, who really changed the course of Christianity. So every one of us, and I mean, even for us whose children are adults, maybe your children are also gone and all that, there are also all sorts of distractions. There are things that will always call for your attention. But what practical steps do we need to take in order to revitalize our connection with God? In order to hear what God is saying to us in those three days that Esther called for a fast. And she was not, not telling people to fast. She herself was fasting. In those three days, something happened. She got out of her feeling of being overwhelmed, of feeling confused, and God gave her a strategy for what she was going to do, and that is our final S. Out of her spiritual connection, God gave her a strategy. 
And you know, the word, stra the word strategy may sound very high. And for those of you in the marketplace, you know about strategic plans, which nobody looks at after they are done. We just put them in a corner. After five years, we do another one, and we realize we never even started to do what we had start wanted to do. But the simplest way I could define strategy is it is a it's a long-term plan for action, or it is a plan of action to achieve a long-term goal or goals, a plan of action. That is what came out of the fasting. That's what came out of, of, of Esther's connection. The Bible says, and, and we will now not read because we are almost out of time, uh, in chapter 5, if you read chapter 5, verses 1 to 8, and chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, you will see how this strategy unfolds. In chapter 5, it starts saying that by saying that on the third day of the fast, on the third day of the fast, the fast was not even over, on the third day of the fast, Esther approached the king. And, and I love this passage, these last passages, because to me they look like a movie. Esther knew the danger. She has not been summoned by the king. But God just gave her this plan, and it was unfolding by the moment. And she just appeared, you know, she dressed up in her royal robes, and she just appeared around where the king was. She was noticed. And because she did not have that habit of always intruding on the king's business, the king knew there must be something. And the king, was ask, the king asked her, what is it that you want me to do for you? Are you seeing God in that plan? I'm sure these are not things Esther had even thought, maybe this is how it will unfold. But she went step by step. I was imagining some of us, especially, I mean, like if you're married or if you're employed and you have this request that you want to make. Do you know so many of us do not even have a plan of action? Ladies, how many of you, if you're married, you know your husband wants, you want your husband to do something for you. The minute he gets into that door, you start, you open your mouth and you start. I need this to be done. Oh, we have not had food. I don't know for how many days. Mtoto alifukuzwa because of school fees. But I want you to see Esther's demeanor. She was very calm, very collected. She did not immediately respond to what the king asked. I mean, she was being offered even up to half of the kingdom. So when she was asked, she did not say, king, live forever. There is this plan to annihilate my people. Can you do something about it? No, she did not say anything. She just started by saying, I would like to invite Herman for dinner. I mean, that was as far-fetched as it could be. You're being offered half the kingdom, and you know there's a very pressing need, and you're here talking about, invite this guy for dinner. The king couldn't suspect anything. So Haman was invited to dinner, day one. Nothing was said. He just enjoyed himself. He felt special. He didn't know he was being set up. And then Esther asked the king, could you invite Haman again for dinner? I mean, she's creating suspense. Why is it Haman being? Of course, Haman was very close to the king. But Esther had a plan. 
she had a strategy. She needed the king to be where the day she spoke about what it is that she wanted done, everything was clearly spelled out. You know, when the day came when Haman was invited again for dinner, and it was the day that Esther felt the freedom to tell the king, all her thoughts were organized. She did not tell the king that this man, Haman, is an evil man. She built up her story. And she told the king how there is a plan and how she knows that that plan cannot be reversed. And you know, the king is listening as if he's a spectator in these affairs. He signed something. He didn't know what it, will, it would mean. But Esther made sure that for that moment when she had an audience with the king, she said everything that needed to be said. She talked about the danger that the Jews were in, her people. She went all the way, and the climax of it was this evil man, Haman. She accomplished everything in a very short time because she had a plan of action. She knew the Jews needed to be saved, but she also knew that Haman needed to be dealt with. She did not go in half measures, but that could only have been a strategy that came from the Lord. And in one short moment, everything that needed to be done to save the Jews was done by the king. There was a way of reversing that edict, even if not reversing it, but giving the Jews a chance of survival. But Haman's issue was, his case was closed. He was sent away to be impaled. That is what you call strategy. There is a way that Esther could have handled this thing and it could have backfired on her. So, when we ask ourselves, how will God's purposes be accomplished in us? We need a strategy. Please, let us not be people who are just everywhere. We don't know what God has called us to. We don't know um, how God wants it done. We are not spiritually connected, so we don't hear from God. Esther demonstrates in a very short story what it means to be beautiful, to be significant, to be spiritually connected, and to have a strategy for accomplishing God's purposes. And that's my prayer for each one of us, that God will help us as individual women to see the purposes that he wants to accomplish in our lives. What destinies do we want to change? Will somebody say when your eulogy is read or when, your, when tributes are given, will they be able to say, this woman served God's purposes? She was not just beautiful to look at, but she accomplished a significant purpose in our lives. There are times when we struggle to write people's eulogies or to write tributes. Or you go to a tribute meeting or what we call condolence meetings. First of all, it's a problem getting people there. Secondly, even when you have people gathered, they don't know what to, to say about you. But you go to other people's, you know, condolence meetings, and people are literally competing to say what difference you made in their lives or the, or the departed person made in their lives. I pray that God will use each one of us to serve his purposes, that we will not have just passed by looking nice, holding good jobs, but never accomplishing anything significant. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you 
for the story of Queen Esther and for reminding us that it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter um, our family backgrounds. That what matters is that you want to accomplish significant purposes through our lives. And so we pray that as we sit here, that if we have not begun the journey of hearing what it is that you, you are calling us to, if we have not connected with you enough for us to hear very clearly what your instructions have, are for us, our Father, we pray, would you help us begin this journey? We know that none of us here is too small, too young, too old, too inexperienced, too unexposed, whatever our categories are. Each one of us will serve a significant purpose in causing the destiny of those that you have placed in our hands to change. Help us, Lord, to hear from you. Give us critical plans of action of how we are going to allow you to use us to change the destiny of many people around us. We yield our lives to you. We surrender our will. We surrender everything we have to you and ask that Jehovah God, would you take preeminence in our lives and would you use us, Father, in ways that we could never even imagine because you have a reason why you placed each one of us on this earth and why you called each one of us into your kingdom. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.